The best solution was to hold back Lake Powell by installing metal flashboards eight feet high on the spillway gates. These would replace the smaller wooden boards and would allow reasonable operations until Lake Powell stopped rising. A contractor, Guy F. Atkinson Company, began installing the boards on the 4th of July, working around the clock. Within two days, the big flash boards and the bracing were in place. Spillway flows could then be reduced by lowering the gates. In addition, the tunnels could be temporarily closed for an inspection. Engineers from the Denver Engineering and Research Center boarded a small cart to be slowly lowered by a winch into the darkening cavern. These men found cavitation holes so deep that they could not proceed further. The rise of Lake Powell slowed as expected, and by late August 1983, all spillway flows were shut down. First item on the repair schedule was to inspect the damage. In the left tunnel, cavitation had initiated a series of large holes about 8 to 10 feet deep and 25 feet wide. They found the concrete lining gone for several feet up the sides. Steel reinforcing bars vibrated so violently by the moving water that they had broken off from metal fatigue. Before them, a huge underwater hole of unknown depth. Altogether, it was to be a massive repair undertaking to cost millions of dollars. And there would be a rush. The rain and snow that had caused the high river flows of 1983 showed no signs of abating. In fact, as 1984 approached, frequent heavy fall rains and early winter snows swept into the distant Headwater Mountains. With no time to waste, the contractor began an access route, a 180-foot-long tunnel cut into the side of the left spillway. A temporary roadway was placed across the power plant transformer deck and a similar access tunnel was cut into the damaged right spillway. With the standing water finally pumped out, the spillway disclosed an amazing array of rock rubble that had been gouged from the tunnel floor, including this huge boulder that had been broken loose and lifted out by tons of falling water. Most astonishing of all, was the big hole at the elbow section found to be 32 feet deep, 40 feet wide, and 150 feet long. Within a few days, concrete was flowing into the hole. 2,500 cubic yards were needed to fill it. Broken, eroded concrete was removed by drilling and blasting to reshape the tunnel to make it ready for a new three-foot-thick concrete lining. Dangerous work, but performed carefully by drilling ahead and under the old concrete. And to keep the sandstone in place, rock bolts several feet long were tightened into place. As the winter came on, a curtain was drawn over the spillway portals to keep out the cold desert winds. But in the mountains, the snow continued to deepen. It was beginning to appear that the Glen Canyon spillways might indeed be needed in 1984. Lake Powell had been drawn down 27 vertical feet, which represented an immense amount of available storage. But was it enough? A continual problem at the Glen Canyon Spillway repair, as well as a major source of discomfort to the workers, was the water that seeped into the tunnel and fell like rain or like a waterfall. Much of the water could be collected in pipes and directed to pumping stations.
network then proceeded on the network of reinforcing steel bars and the placement of the new concrete lining. Meanwhile, at the Engineering and Research Center of the Bureau of Reclamation in Denver, scientists and engineers worked quickly to redesign the spillways. A model of the Glen Canyon spillways was used to design notches called air slots. Since cavitation can never be completely eliminated, a cushion of air bubbles can be introduced that will absorb the shock of the collapsing vapor cavities. This will prevent damage to the concrete. A notch of precise size and shape cut into a spillway turns this water white with air bubbles that foam into the rushing water. The technology of air slots was unknown when Glen Canyon Dam was built in the early 1960s. Up to this time, it was believed that the only solution for cavitation damage on tunnel-type spillways was to provide smooth surfaces but in time, even the smoothest surface roughens with calcium deposits or small cracks in the concrete. A number of reclamation dams with tunnel spillways were spared damage from cavitation only because the spillways were rarely, if ever, used and then only for small amounts of water. After the effectiveness of air slots was demonstrated in laboratory research, they were installed in the spillway at Yellowtail Dam in Montana and in the spillway at Flaming Gorge Dam in Utah. But neither Yellowtail nor Flaming Gorge had the magnitude or the particular design features of Glen Canyon Dam. A series of laboratory investigations determined that the air slots at Glen Canyon had to be four feet wide, four feet deep, and had to be located 253 feet below the spillway gates a long way down into a steep, dark tunnel where seepage water poured in eternal rains. A platform hung from cables served as a space station for the drillers, who pierced the old concrete lining almost 3,500 times.